Turn with me to the book of Luke. And this is the basis for David's study, signs that point to the soon return of Jesus, which I appreciate as a powerful theme. So the Luke, Luke the 21st chapter, so you know, Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark 13 are all the eschatologic chapters in the Bible, and John's eschatologic chapter is called the book of Revelation, describing end time events. So chapters, chapter 21 of Luke, verses 25 to 28, describes his second coming. So join me as we read. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of, nation, distress of nations, wow. with perplexity, and sea and water and, and waves roaring. It's not enough light. Men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth and for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and with great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up. Look up. Praise God. Look up. And lift up your heads, for your Redeemer, your redemption draweth, what does it say? Nigh, near. Praise God. So, we have the opportunity now for prayer. I'll be coming up front. Can we still gather up front or not? Uh, not at this time. Can we be six feet apart? We can gather six feet apart if you wish. Otherwise, you can kneel where you are, but we'll come together as a family in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so grateful we can, we can come together with freedom to worship you. Thank you for the gifts you've given each one of us, the gift of breath, your spirit, the gift of life, the gift of salvation in Christ Jesus. Lord, we are humbled before you, seeing what you have done for us, as us, through us. Lord, we pray that we're each one used of you to bring this gospel message to the world. This world is rapidly coming to its end. We see the signs all about us, as you've indicated through your prophets. So Lord, we ask that you do the work in us, finish what you began. Let it be your faith and your glory alone that is manifest in our lives. Let it be Jesus who is seen and not us. Let your spirit guide our words, our actions, our very thoughts. Let the mind that was in Christ be in us also. Lord, we are truly carnal, fallen, sinful beings. We repent. May we repent with the repentance of Jesus, his gift, his virtue. And may you fill us continually with your spirit and dispel and displace all that is not of you. Many in this church, Lord, are sick or fearful or destitute in so many ways. Lord, we lift each one of them up to you. Hold each one close to you in your bosom, Lord. Comfort them, guide them, let them know your love, let them know your care. Let them know that you are their creator and their redeemer, and that you want them to be with you for eternity. 
Prepare each one, Lord. I ask also a special blessing on this very church. May we each go forward as ministers of the gospel of Christ. Strengthen us. Move us. Have us be where you would have us be and speak what you would have us speak. And may we live a life constantly in prayer, seeking your guidance, seeking you, and holding fast to you alone. I also ask a special blessing on David Morehouse today, Lord, as he gives the message you would have him give from your word. May your word be spoken powerfully, may it be spoken in truth, and may the words that he speak be anointed of you. And may we hear that which you would have us understand, truly understand at this time of Earth's history, that we can be secure in your word and in Christ. For this I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Sanctuary up in heaven. 
Thank you, Grace. That beautiful special music. It's a sermon in itself. I feel like I could just have the benediction right now almost. Friends, I'm happy to be here, and I'm happy to see you here too as well. We serve such an awesome God, so merciful, so loving. Friends, today the sermon title is Signs That Point to the Soon Return of Jesus. I believe we're rapidly running out of time, friends. Back in 2019, I knew this was going to be a prophetic year, 2020. I'm not saying I'm a prophet, that I, like I have it all figured out, but I just felt it in my heart. I've been preaching this message now for over 12 years. I remember growing up a Seventh-day Adventist all my life, but I strayed away for many, many years, close to 30 years I strayed away. But I remember my mother always telling me that Jesus was coming soon, and I heard it through Christian education as well, that Jesus is coming soon. Friends, we're living it right now. He really is coming soon. I want to go home. But we're, but we're going to be tested. Each one of us are going to be tested for everything that's coming upon this earth. But God will give us the strength to go through whatever we have to go through if we trust him. Amen. But we have to be completely hid in Christ. Amen. I want to start with a word of prayer before I get started, friends. So will you join me again for a word of prayer? Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, this is not about me. This is all about you. I pray, Lord, that the words that you give me will be your words. That you will take from me, Lord, what is not of you. Forgive me, Lord, for where I have fallen short. Lord, I pray for an outpouring of your Holy Spirit, not just upon this church, but upon me as well. Jesus, thank you so much for all that you do. And we pray this, Lord, in the precious name of your Son. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, almost 20 years ago, I was getting ready for work. And I probably was about a half an hour from leaving the house. My wife and me were getting ready for work. And my mother gave me a phone call. She called, and the phone rang, and we answered the phone, and it was my mother. And she said, turn on your TVs. The World Trade Center is being attacked. This was Tuesday morning, September 11th of 2001. And as I turned on the TV, I wasn't a Christian then. And as I seen that jet crash into that second tower, my first thought was, there's going to be mass casualties. It really shook me up. I wasn't a Christian then. But I knew in my heart that this was the first major sign, and I believe Jesus allowed this to wake us up. The next day, the following day, I was like in a state of shock. I went down and purchased a paper, 
a day of terror. And I was reading it, and it said, Shock Valley Wonders. This was in Medford, Oregon. What do you do about it? And I read this one section where it says, It scares the bejesus out of me, Alan said along Main Street late Tuesday morning. How in the world are we ever going to feel safe again? People knelt right down in the airport and were grabbing a hold of each other and praying and crying. That event, folks, that took place on that day took a chunk out of my heart. So I started paying attention after that more closely to what was going on in our world relating to the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. My mother always told me that the only way we were going to be able to endure is to be hidden Christ. But I wasn't ready to come back to God then at that point. But I'd like to read you something out of Testimonies for the Church in Volume 9, starting on page 12. On one occasion, when in New York City, I was in a night season called upon to behold buildings rising story after story toward heaven. These buildings were warranted to be fireproof, and they were erected to glorify their owners and builders. Higher and still higher these buildings rose, and in them the most costly material was used. Those to whom these buildings belonged were not asking themselves, how can we best glorify God? The Lord was not in their thoughts. I thought, oh, that those who are thus investing their means could see their course as God sees it. They are piling up magnificent buildings, but how foolish in the sight of the ruler of the universe in their planning and devising. They are not studying with all the powers of heart and mind how they may glorify God. They have lost sight of this, the first duty of man. As these lofty buildings went up, the owners rejoiced with ambitious pride that they had money to use in gratifying self and provoking the envy of their neighbors. Much of the money that they thus invested had been obtained through extraction, through grinding down the poor. They forgot that in heaven an account of every business transaction is kept, every unjust deal, Every fraudulent act is there recorded. The time is coming when in their fraud and isolence, men will reach a point that the Lord will not permit them to pass, and they will learn that there is a limit to the forbearance of Jehovah. The scene that next passed before me was an alarm of fire. Men looked at the lofty and supposedly fireproof buildings and said they are perfectly safe, but these buildings were consumed as if made of pitch. The fire engines could do nothing to stay the destruction. The firemen were unable to operate the engines. I am instructed that when the Lord's time comes, should no change have taken place in the hearts of proud, ambitious human beings, men will find that the hand that has been strong to save will be strong to destroy. No earthly power can stay the hand of God. No material can be used in the erection of buildings that will preser preserve them from destruction when God's appointed time comes to send retribution on men for their disregard of his law and for their selfish ambition. Friends, this was written over 100 years ago. And on page 11, this chapter is called The Last Crisis for the Coming of the King. God has always had a prophet to warn his people and to warn the world of coming destruction before it happens. I'd like to take you to Amos, right after the book of Joel. Amos chapter 3. Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals, this is in, starting in verse 7, surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. Friends, I'd like to invite you also to turn with me 
to Matthew chapter 24. And we're going to start in verse 3. Matthew chapter 24, starting in verse 3. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be, this, what will be the sign of your coming, and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Friends, in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus speaks of wars and earthquakes and such things, but says these are just the beginning of sorrows, and the end is not yet. Now the word sorrows in the original language meant birth pains, the pain in childbirth. Now pangs speak of frequency and intensity. As a woman gets nearer the birth, the pangs become more frequent and intense. This is true also for the signs of the end times, friends. These signs began not long after Jesus' day. And as Jesus quoted, the end would not yet be because this was just the beginning of sorrows. But friends, throughout history, we have seen the pangs signs become more frequent and intense, cultivating in the day that we live in now, where the pangs are so frequent and intense that we must be right at the time of delivery, when Jesus is soon to return. So don't let anyone fool you into believing that the signs today are just the beginning of sorrows, and the end is not yet. Friends, the beginning of sorrows started nearly 2,000 years ago with the persecution of the early church and the destruction of Jerusalem. There was a man that walked around the city of Jerusalem for I think it was close to seven years telling people to be prepared to get out, you know, that this city was going to be destroyed. And he was trying to tell them that they needed to give their hearts to Jesus, you know, they needed to be hidden Christ. He was going around telling these people in this city for for, for many years. And they got so tired of him telling this message. They thought he was, um, some of the authorities of that city were thinking, we got to quiet this guy. And they ended up throwing him in prison, arresting him for doing what he was doing. He died in prison. A few years later, Jerusalem was destroyed, friends. Let's talk a little bit about earthquakes and famines and pestilences. Back in December 26th of 2004, friends, I was actually at a restaurant. My wife, and her parents, and myself. And we got a strange phone call that day. And um, I think it was her father that got the phone call. And then he, after he got off the phone, he proceeded to tell us that Indonesia just had a major uh, tsunami and earthquake that traveled along the coastline there. And there was many tourists out there at that time. They had a nine-point earthquake that was 19 miles deep, 100 miles off the coast. And within minutes, just a very short time, 100-foot waves are coming in to the coast. People are fleeing for their lives and running. They had no warning. Over a quarter of a million people perished, friends. May of 2008, Miramar, Burma, ruled from a cyclone in Nargis. It was the worst natural disaster ever that, ever that they had ever experienced that claimed more than 130,000 lives. The China earthquake, just days after this 
event that took place in Miramar. Where over 80,000 80, people perished. The earthquake was over an eight point on the Richter scale. Thousands of, um, over 7,000 school buildings collapsed, killing thousands of school children. A few years later, January 12th of 2010, Haiti earthquake. The death toll was over a quarter of a million people. Bodies were lying all over the streets of Port-au-Prince. They had a seven-point earthquake. It's like one event after another just keeps happening. I believe the Lord is trying to tell us something. March 11th of 2011, Japan suffered a nine-point earthquake and a powerful tsunami. The death toll was over 18,000 people. Later that year, in 2011, I was actually on the road driving truck. I was in the state of Washington. In 2011, they had a twister, a tornado twister outbreak, the second deadliest in U.S. history. The governor said there were more tornadoes in a single day during the outbreak ever recorded in U.S. history. Of the 312 twisters that were spawned, 226 occurred within a 24-hour period. One tornado went through three states over a mile and a half wide and was on the ground for over 100 miles and killed over 300 people. Days later, Joplin, Missouri was almost wiped off the map killing over 120 people, friends. Then in 2013, November 22nd, the Philippines suffered a typhoon. The death toll was well over 5,000 people. It, they said, the news people said it could have been the strongest storm ever to hit in world history. Hurricane Sandy, October 30th of 2012. Over 100 people perished. Worst storm New York has ever seen in 100 years. I watched a documentary on that for an hour right after that happened. They had gas lines that were over 10 miles long for people trying to get gas. And they were even pulling guns on each other because they were so afraid that they weren't going to be able to fill up their gas tanks. Friends, it just seems to be one event after another. October 2nd of 2017, Las Vegas shooting, 59 dead and over 500 wounded. I'd like to take you to, to volume nine of the testimonies again, friends, starting in page 11. Volume nine of the testimonies starting in page 11. We are living in the time of the end. That fast fulfilling signs of the times declare that the coming of the Christ is near at hand. The days in which we live are solemn and important. The Spirit of God is gradually but surely being withdrawn from the earth. Plagues and judgments are already fallen upon the despisers of the grace of God. The calamities by land and sea, the unstable state of society, the alarms of war are potentious. They forecast the approaching events of the greatest magnitude. The agencies of evil are combining their forces and consolidating. They are strengthening for the last great crisis. Great changes are soon to take place in our world. Friends, these great changes have already taken place. I believe that with all my heart. And the final movements will be rapid ones. The condition of the things in the world shows that troublesome times are right upon us. The daily papers are full of indications of terrible conflict in the near future. Bold robberies are a frequent occurrence. Strikes are common. Thefts and murders are committed on every hand. Men possessed of demons are taking the lives of men, women, and little children. Oh, friends, we're running out of time. I believe that completely. Now, let's go, that's skipping down. Let's go to famines. 
Do you know Yemen, Yemen in Africa right now is facing the worst famine in over 100 years? The UN warns the world coronavirus may cause famines of biblical proportions. This is what they're saying, friends. They also warn that the, the UN also was warning that COVID-19 could push 130 million people into starvation. It just seems to be one event after another. There's seven countries in Africa and India that are suffering a plague of locusts, a, a biblical scope in 2020. I'd like to take you to uh, Exodus. I think it's Exodus chapter... I believe it's Exodus chapter 10 in the Old Testament. Exodus chapter 10, starting in verse 12. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the land of Egypt for the locusts that they may come upon the land of Egypt and eat every herb of the land, all that the hail has left. So Moses stretched out his rod over the land of Egypt and the Lord brought an east wind on the land all that day and all that night. When it was morning, the east wind brought the locusts and the locusts went up over the land of Egypt and rested on all the territory of Egypt. They were very severe. Previously, there had been no such locusts as they, nor shall there be such after them. For they covered the face of the whole earth so that the land was darkened, and they ate every herb on the, of the land and all the fruit of the trees which the hail had left. So there remained nothing green on the trees or on the plants of the field throughout the land of Egypt. This, take, this took place... When Moses went to Pharaoh, when God told him to go to Pharaoh to let the children of Israel go, but he wouldn't let them go. And this was the eight, I believe, yeah, this was the eight plague. And there was ten plagues. And um, friends, this just seems to be one event after another that is happening right now. And the thing about it, more than anything that I've noticed is all these events are taking place at the same time. They're all happening at the same times. I was just on the internet just a few days ago, and China is experiencing some of the worst flooding they've ever seen in over 100 years. There's millions that are on the verge of... This could be catastrophic. They got a couple of dams that could break and they're watching it really closely. It just seems to be one event after another. What does Jesus say in Matthew chapter 24? How he gives a parable. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 32. Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branches already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, you get that when you see all these things? Know that it is near at the doors. We're seeing all these things that are happening at the very same time, friends. Coronavirus, COVID-19. I talked to my brother last night on the phone, and he works in the medical field. I got two brothers that work in the medical field. And I said, I hear California is a real hot spot right now. I said, sometimes I wonder if this is a hoax. I hear it from so many people. And he said, well, he goes, we're having, we have more patients in UC Davis, which is a very large hospital, that have COVID-19 than we've seen since this, since this has started. I think he said it was somewhere right around 30 patients. But the doctors are treating them with drugs, and so most of them, they've never, they haven't had one death in UC Davis with all the people that have been coming there with COVID. Now, if you read in the last day events by Ellen G. White on page 26, I'd like to read you this. It says, Satan is working in the atmosphere. He is poisoning the atmosphere. And here we are dependent upon God for our lives, our present and eternal lives. And being in the position that we are, we need to be wide awake, wholly devoted, wholly converted, wholly consecrated to God. 
but we seem to sit as though we were paralyzed. God of heaven, wake us up. God has not restrained the powers of darkness from carrying forward, forward their deadly work of vitating the air. One of the sources of life and nutrition with a deadly masama. Not only is vegetable life affected, but man suffers from pestilences. These things are a result of drops from the vials of God's wrath being sprinkled on the earth and are but faint rep representations of what will be in the near future. Famines will increase. Pestilence will sweep away thousands. Dangers are all around us from the powers, from the powers without the satanic workings within. But the restraining power of God is now being restrained, is now being exercised. Friends, I believe that this is God's mercy that's going on. I really do. I believe that all these events that are taking place is trying to, he's saying, have that relationship with me. I believe he is trying to wake up this world. I believe he's trying to wake up this church, friends. Mass animal deaths all over the world as well. Fish and birds, you name it. May 4th of 2020, more than 1,000 birds fell from the sky in Missouri. They were caught in a storm. People woke up in this subdivision and they seen birds all over their yard. July 1st of 2020, this was in South Africa. They found 350 dead elephants. They're not quite sure how, it, how they died. It was a mystery. July 3rd, hundreds of de dead pigeons washed up on the coast of Sao Paulo, Brazil. June 26, thousands of dead dolphins washing ashore in France. Talks a little bit about this in Hosea and Zephaniah. Hosea chapter 4, starting in verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord, you children of Israel. For the Lord brings a charge against the inhabitants of the land. There is no truth or mercy or knowledge of God in the land by swearing and lying, killing and stealing and committing adultery. They break all restraint with bloodshed upon bloodshed. Therefore the land will mourn, and everyone who dwells there will waste away with the beasts of the field and the birds of the air. Even the fish of the sea will be taken away. These animals, they've been talking about it now for over nine years. It seems to me like history seems to be repeating itself. You know, you talk about the children of Israel, ancient Israel. Brothers and sisters, there's really no difference. We're modern Israel. God loves us so much. But because we've sinned and broken the, of his commandments and his covenant, these things are happening. God doesn't want these things to happen. He, I mean, doesn't want these things to happen, but he's... he's allowing this to happen, to wake his children up. Our world is dying, friends. Amen. I know there's a lot of beautiful things in this earth, but Jesus is coming soon. He's trying to do everything he can to bring us to have a closer relationship with him. Because if we're not hidden Christ, friends, we're not going to have that faith and trust that we need when the time really comes. Friends, we haven't seen nothing yet. I'm not trying to scare you. In 1 John chapter 4, 1 John chapter 4, starting in verse 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We loved him because he first loved us. Amen. Friends, Jesus desperately wants to have that relationship with each one of us. He's doing everything he can to hold back the winds of strife. 
And this message needs to go out. There's so many people out there that are hungry to hear God's truth. I had a powerful divine appointment the last two days. I went down to Weed, California to pick up this load of railroad iron and stuff. And the guy that loaded us, I had a chance to witness to him, to tell him about Jesus. I gave him a great controversy. And I also told him about the coming crisis, the Sunday law crisis that is coming. And I told him, friend, I said, I'm not trying to scare you. I said, but what's coming, the world has no clue of. But we need to have that relationship with Jesus. We're all going to be tested on this. I told him about the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Daniel, the third chapter. And this guy, this guy was really hungry. He took all these books, and I gave him a copy of the sermon that I preached, Is Worship Really the Last Test for God's People? And he was really excited that I gave him this information. People are seeing what's going on around our world, and God wants to use each one of us, friends, to be instruments for him. Amen. He's willing to use us if we'll let him use us, but we have to let him use us first. We have to say, Lord, we can, we can do this together, but you gotta. we have to have that relationship with him. If we don't have that relationship with him, friends, we're not going to want to share Jesus. Amen. It just seems like there's one event after another, friends, that just keeps happening. But what this really boils down to, friends, is about worship. Who do we worship? Do we worship the creator God or do we worship Satan? the serpent that was in the tree with garden in, with, in, at the Garden of Eden. I just pulled this out of uh, the Internet the other day. And Pope Francis announced September 12th of last year his plan to launch a global education pack to unite efforts to combat climate change. The leader of the Vatican called on world leaders to come together in May 14th of 2020 to discuss his Laudato Si proposal to reduce global warming. But because of this COVID-19, this date has been set for October, between October 13th and the 17th. Friends, I believe that Sunday legislation is literally right around the corner. I believe that with all my heart. But I also believe this too, that God's people are in every denomination. The last thing I'm trying to do is put down the Roman Catholic Church because many of God's people are going to come from the Roman Catholic Church as well. But the teachings that they teach, it's not the people in the, in the church but it's the teachings that they teach are not in accordance with the Word of God. Amen. Never before has there been such a need to unite our efforts in a broad educational alliance to form mature individuals capable of overcoming division and antagonism to restore the fabric of relationships for the sake of a more fraternal humanity. An alliance is needed between the Earth's inhabitants and our common home, which we are bound to care for and respect. I invite everyone to work for this alliance and to be committed and individually and within our communities to nurture the dream of humanism rooted in solidarity and responsive both to, for, the humani for the humanity's aspirations and to God's plan. The most significant personalities in the world are invited to take part in this proposed initiative, political, culture, cultural, and religious in a particular in particular, the young people to whom the future belongs. The goal is to arouse an awareness and a wave of responsibility for the common good of humanity, starting from the young and reaching all people of goodwill. Some of the things that Pope Francis is saying sound like they, like they are coming right out of the book of Revelation. Pastor Greg Sherita um, expounds on this. However, by ignoring God's instructions to rest on the seventh day, he said in a video in October, Pope Francis is referring to 
Laudito Sae, which is in cynical on climate change. There he offers some suggestions on how to combat climate change, including reducing carbon emissions, carpooling, planting trees, and recycling. These are not bad suggestions, but in an cynical, Pope Francis also suggests Sundays with keeping a better environment. On Sunday, our participation precipita precipitation in the Eucharist has special importance. Sunday is meant, to be a, is meant to be a day which heals our relationship with God, with ourselves and with others, with the world. The, implica the implication here is that we need to have a law mandating rest on Sunday, so it appears that his agenda on climate change includes giving Sunday rest and worship mandated by law to improve the environment. Friends, the biblical preacher Greg Sherita claimed the meeting will fulfill Bible prophecies told in the book of Revelation. Mr. Sherita went on to claim that Saturday should actually be the day of rest and not Sunday. Therefore, those that follow the Pope's order will be ignoring God's wishes. He added, some of the things that Pope Francis is saying sound like they are coming right out of the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation describes a religious polarization that takes place in the end times people will be, will be divided into two camps those that receive the mark of the beast and those that receive the seal of God those that receive the mark of the beast will be those that go along with Sunday rest and worship laws while those who receive the seal of God will decide to stay true to God's commandments and keep the seventh day holy which is on Saturday and not Sunday However, the Catholic Church changed the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. No man has the right to change God's commandments. Amen. Friends, in Revelation chapter 17, I'd like to read you a couple of passages out of that chapter. It clearly shows us where we're at right now, what, they're, what he's trying to do, what he's trying to bring all the leaders together. In Revelation chapter 17, verse 13, these are of one mind, and they will give their power and authority to the beast. And then skipping down to verse 17, For God has put it into their hearts to fulfill his purpose, to be of one mind, and to give their kingdom to the beast, until the words of God are fulfilled. Friends, it's all coming together. We're rapidly running out of time. And Jesus is holding back the winds of strife. Just a little bit longer because he's not willing that any should perish. He's looking at each one of us, Lord. I mean, he's looking at each one of us, friends, to see his likeness in each one of us. When he sees that, he's going to come again. That's what he's waiting for. Oh, friends, we serve such an awesome God, a God that loves us so much a God that's always there for us and never willing to leave us or forsake us. But we have to have that relationship with him. We have to trust in him. In Daniel, the seventh chapter, Daniel, the seventh chapter, starting in verse 25, he shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and they shall intend to change times and law. I'd like to read you something out of Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, starting in page 451. By the decree enforcing the institution of the papacy in violation of the law of God, our nation will disconnect herself fully from righteousness when Protestantism shall stretch her hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of the Roman power, when she shall reach over the abyss to clasp hands with spiritualism, when under the influence of the threefold union our country shall repudiate every principle of its constitution as a Protestant and Republican government and shall make provision for the propagation of papal falsehoods and delusions then we may know that the time has come for the marvelous working of Satan and that the end is near. Mm -hmm. Friends, it's all happening. It's all falling into place. 
We need to get out there. We need to spread this three angels message like never before. There's so many people out there that are hungry that want to hear this truth. But God can't use us if we're not willing. But if we're willing, he can use us in a big and powerful way, friends. I truly believe that with all my heart. We serve such an awesome God, and he is so patient and long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance of him. I was talking to my uh, daughter just the other day. My daughter came down from Salem, my oldest daughter. She's 38 years old. And she was raised in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. My mother raised her. I told her, I said, Christine, we got to have that relationship with Jesus. I said, things are really happening in this world like never before. And she goes, yeah, I know. I see these things happening. She goes, uh, it's everything that Grandma used to tell me about. And um, I told her, I said, keep in touch. I said, but stay close to Jesus. Get to know him. I pray for my wife and my children every single day. My mother never gave up on me. Amen. She prayed for me for 30 years. That's what we need to do, friends. We need to be praying for our loved ones and children, our friends, as much as possible, and never to give up. I don't have it all figured out. But I know this. That if we surrender it all to Jesus, he'll give us the strength to go whatever we have to go through, no matter what it is. He loves us that much. He's not willing that any should perish. I love that text in John chapter 14, starting in verse 1, where it says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. What an awesome God. He wants to be with us for eternity. I really believe that we are the last generation of God's people. I believe we're here, friends. I really believe that. They're using this COVID-19 to destroy this country, to take away our freedoms completely, to repudiate, to repudiate our Constitution, to bring in Sunday legislation. I think there's a very dark road ahead of us but if we're hidden in Christ, we have nothing to fear. God will give us the strength no matter what we have to go through. You know, if you look at the stories through the Bible, Jesus has always had a peculiar group of people. David, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Elijah, Moses, the list goes on and on. Even back in the Dark Ages, many martyrs died for Jesus. They killed millions of Christians. Even the ones that were burning at the stake. God's going to be with his people, friends, no matter what we go through. He promises us that. Do you believe that? Do we trust God at what he says, according to what the Bible says, or do we take from the Bible what makes us comfortable? Jesus loves us that much, friends. He wouldn't have even made it out of the Garden of Gethsemane if it wasn't for his heavenly Father and if it wasn't for the angels that gave him the strength to make it to Calvary. Amen. And he would have gave up his own existence if it was for just one person. That's how much he loves us. That's an amazing thought. I can't even imagine that. 
He loves us that much. Thank you, Jesus. But we have to hang on for dear life. We can't let go. Just a little while longer, friends. Just a little while longer. Philippians chapter 1, verse, verse 6, being confident of this very thing. He that has begun a good work in you will complete that work until the day of Jesus Christ. See, he's going to complete that work in each one of us, friends, as long as we don't let go, as long as we don't turn away. But we have to trust and believe that. Will you bow your heads with me as we have prayer? Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for all that you do. I thank you so much, Lord, for your mercy and your grace for holding back the winds of strife. I thank you, Lord, for this COVID-19. I know this may sound crazy, Lord, but this is your mercy. This is your grace. Lord, we know you're coming soon. I pray that each person, Lord, that is listening to this message, whether it be on YouTube or or wherever it's on the internet or, or in this church, Lord, that they will completely give their hearts to you. Lord, we have to die to self. We have to take up our cross and follow you. That's the only way we are going to make it, is if we hang on to you for dear life. Jesus, thank you so much for your love and for your sacrifice. You didn't deserve to be on that cross, Lord. We did. I know I did personally. I do right now. Thank you, Jesus, for hearing my prayer. And I pray this in the precious name of your Son, in Jesus' name.